let's um, turn to the phlegmatic temperament. And uh, this is the fourth of the temperaments. And uh, Mike, uh, Mike and I were talking just before class started here. And Mike made the remark that none of these temperaments are written in stone. And that's true. You might be, let's say for instance, you're a sanguine. And you may have a multitude of the sanguine tendencies, but there might be some of them there that have absolutely nothing to do with you. That's because we're all a blend of different temperaments, and uh, you, you might have got missed on, on two or three of those temperaments. And that's true all the way across the board. So it's true, these things are not written in stone. This is written in stone, the Word of God. It's eternal. Uh, this certainly is not. And so, as we examine the temperaments, we're going to look at the phlegmatic tonight and look at his characteristics. Slow and cool and well-balanced. Slow, cool, and well-balanced. Boy, that describes the phlegmatic. Outside impressions have a humorous effect. And this is true. The, the, the phlegmatic temperament is uh, the temperament that is a spectator and everything strikes him humorous or almost everything and so he can see humor in almost any situation we'll get into that a little deeper uh, in, a, in a little bit later in, in the lesson here but the phlegmatic is happily reconciled to life and to his present existence and this makes him completely different from the other three temperaments. The sanguine, he strives to catch every impression. He doesn't want to miss a thing. Everything that comes along, the sanguine, uh, he wants to be a part of it, he wants to be the center of it. The melancholic, on the other hand, he's in conflict with reality because he has such a high standard and it's not a perfect world that we live in. The cleric, he struggles to change things around him but the phlegmatic, he carries an attitude of superiority towards his entire environment, everything around him. He can take it as it is. The old song that was written years ago, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. That was uh, certainly, I had a phlegmatic in mind. He can just take anything the way it is and be happy with it. And he doesn't try to change it or anything like that. He can live with it. And that's a good attitude to have. He's a spectator at all times. You have to remember this about the phlegmatic. He's not out on the playing field. He's a spectator up in the stands. He watches. He's a people watcher. He watches everything. The sanguine is abhorred by things. The melancholic is annoyed by things. The choleric tries to change things. But the phlegmatic, he's just happily reconciled to all the things that are around him. He doesn't try to make changes, he doesn't try to make improvements, and uh, particularly if it's going to cost him effort, because he's basically a lazy person, and uh, he doesn't want to exert any more energy than he has to. The phlegmatic is never taken by surprise. You just can't do that, because he's so low-key that he's just laid back, he's, he, he's ready for everything. It just, it just doesn't surprise him. You never catch him off guard. You never find him to be tense. He's totally resigned to his fate and desires very little excitement. Now before we go any farther with this, I want to point out a fact that um, we haven't pointed out yet. Everybody in life is strongly one of these temperaments, maybe, uh, well, in, uh, for sure, a blend of at least two, maybe three or even four temperaments. You may have a total blend of all four temperaments, but you are basically one strong temperament or, or one leading temperament. Well, um, you'll always be that. Uh, from childhood on through old age, that will always be your basic temperament. However, we go through stages in life in which we see more of uh, the other temperaments in your life. And let me give you an example of what I mean. Childhood is a time when people, no matter what temperament they are, 
Childhood is a time when they exemplify sanguinism. Happy childhood. Kids run, they play, they're excited. That's, that's the, 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 when the sanguine temperament is the strongest in you. When they get into the teen years, they lose some of that sanguine and go into a melancholic temperament. Do you ever wonder why teenagers are so moody and grumpy and uh, uh, so, much, so much of the time? It's uh, this, the melancholic coming out in them. When they get, when, and this carries through into your 20s and 30s, when you get into your middle years, the middle age, the cleric temperament becomes more dominant. And this is when you, uh, you grow up out of that old sucker stage. Uh, you get your head screwed on right. This is when, uh, as a cleric, you don't fall for the things you used to fall for. You're not as gullible anymore. When you reach that cleric, say, here's how to test yourself if you're in that stage yet. When the telephone rings, and it's one of these uh, tele uh, salesmen that come on, are you nice to them? You haven't reached your cleric stage yet. <laughs> Do you listen to them? You haven't reached your cleric stage yet. When you learn just to either not answer if you got a caller ID or, you, or tell them I'm not interested and hang up before they get their spiel out, you're there. <laughs> you're into your, you're into your cl cleric stage. Well, that's, that carries through in our middle years. And then we get into old age, we become more phlegmatic than we ever have been in our life, uh, lifetime before. Uh, we become more and more phlegmatic. Things are not that important anymore to excite us or to cause us to, to be um, uh, going to move mountains and change things and so forth. We, we become more laid back. So we become more and more uh, in old age like the, like the phlegmatic. Or if you have always been a phlegmatic, you, that tendency becomes stronger in your old age. Now let's take the scriptures and turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And I want to read the entire parable again. We've looked at parts of this parable each night. And I want to read the whole thing tonight and draw them all together. Jesus gave this parable and he gave it uh, to, not to show what temperament you were, uh, he gave this parable to show about how the Word of God is important in the life, and it's the Word of God that causes hearts to be changed and to turn to Him. Now, in this parable, in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 3, He spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root and they withered away. Some fell amongst thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, the disciples didn't understand this, and so they asked him for an interpretation. And... He begins the interpretation in verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. And when we looked at that, we said here is a good example of the cleric temperament. There's four different kinds of soil the seed falls in. Here is a, a good example of the cleric temperament. Temperament. He's, he's hard, and the seed falls, falls by the wayside. He's not all that interested. And before it can begin to germinate, uh, Satan comes and catches it away. The cleric, he, he's basically just not interested. The next part that the seed falls on, he says in uh, verse 20, But he that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and at once with joy, Receiveth it. Here's the sanguine. Notice with joy. That's the joyful temperament, the happy temperament. With joy he receives it, yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while. He'll stick it out for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, by and by 
he is offended. Remember it said in, uh, in the giving of it there that there was not much earth, it had no depth and no root. And so the sanguine, he's the one that, it was, it's a new impression that comes into his life. Christianity, it looks good, it looks exciting, and, but it soon passes because nothing lasts very long with the sanguine. We come to the, to the third one in verse 22. He also that receives seed amongst the thorns is he that heareth the word, and then he says, the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. If you remember when we went through the melancholic uh, uh, temperament, we saw that those two things, the cares of the world and the love of money or the deceitfulness of riches were big things in the melancholic's life. And uh, because of his moodiness and because uh, he's so um, uh, moved by those things that he has a hard time um, many times becoming a Christian. He just will not make that decision. But then we come to verse 23, and here's our phlegmatic. He that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, they all did that, and understandeth it, they all didn't do that, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So those are the four responses to the word of God, and they, they fit into the four temperaments. Now, as we talked about earlier, that's not written in stone, so um, don't, uh, don't try to take it too far, but it's a, it's a good biblical example of the four different temperaments. The quiet, unassuming, low-key, phlegmatic. He's there, he, he, he hears the word of God, and he accepts it. And that's the one that bore the most fruit here. I have seen during my lifetime I have seen people from all temperaments come and get saved. I've seen sanguine people come forward and, and just cry and wail, and, and, uh, and then they're just a, like a burst of enthusiasm, but it usually it doesn't last very long. I've seen the melancholic just sob and sob and sob, uncontrollable sobbing. Um, that's not a yardstick to measure how, if they've gotten saved or not. Uh, look at them down the road a piece and see, uh, see how they have uh, responded. I've seen the cleric, not as often of course, but we've seen it happen. But the phlegmatic, the phlegmatic is usually the one that hangs back. Maybe he doesn't even come forward in a meeting. He'll hang back to want to talk to somebody, very quiet, low key, no, no dramatics involved. And those usually turn out to be the solidest Christians. Those are the ones that are, are usually uh, turn out to be grounded and, um, and uh, just solid saints of God. Let's look at another passage of scripture, Philippians chapter four. I'm gonna look at a few verses here and um, bring out another interesting point about the temperaments that we haven't touched on yet. Philippians chapter four. Now Philippians was written by the apostle Paul. We already saw the Apostle Paul as the classic cleric in the scriptures. He was a cleric, there's no doubt about it. He was that driving force. You get a cleric saved and uh, active in the, in the work of the Lord, and man, you got something there. He, I mean, because there's just no, uh, there's just no, uh, he, he's tireless, just going and going and going, all the time, he's on the go for God. You get, you know, it's hard to get a cleric that far, but but when that really happens, well, he's on the go for God. Well, Paul was that way, and he was he was hard in in many of the things what they call today tough love. But as he grew older in life, like we said about the the lifespan, how. Uh, it starts with sanguine, goes to melancholic, then to cleric, and then in your old age you, yeah, you, you express more of the phlegmatic tendencies. Well, Paul was getting old by this time when he wrote the book of Philippians. He'd been saved for over 30 years by this time, so he was, he was probably 60, 70 years old, something like this. Look what he writes to the, to the Philippians here, beginning with uh, chapter 4, verse 10. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care for me hath flourished again. Wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. 
Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. Now notice the word learned. The temperament that you have is not locked in stone. It's learned behavior, much of it. And what you learn, you can unlearn. And if you, if you take your temperament, uh, some of the things in your temperament that, that you know shouldn't, it, it, it's something you know it's not pleasing to God, you turn that over to the Spirit of God, your behavior can change in some of those areas. You commit it to the will of God, and God can, can help you to change from some of those things. If, if for instance, uh, you're a sanguine and, and you just don't care for people, you're always going to be a sanguine, but you might, you, with the help of God, you can develop a, a love for people and a, a caring for people. You're, a melancholic is always going to be a melancholic, but with the help of God, that you, you can forget some of those mood swings and, and uh, be more solid. Well, Paul says, I learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. That is out of the mouth of a phlegmatic. Whatsoever state I am in. To be content. That wasn't natural for Paul. He says, I learned it. I learned how to do that. Well, he's an older man by this time. He's been growing in grace and in knowledge of the Lord. Verse 12, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Abound there means have everything given to me, and then the other end of the spectrum is, is to suffer need. I have, I have nothing. He says, it doesn't matter. If you, if you want to support me, he's saying to the church, uh, I'd be very glad to, to have your support, but you don't need to do it. Don't worry about it. God's going to take care of me. I'm not worried about it. I know how to be perfectly content. And then he come, draws it to conclusion in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So, Paul was growing in grace, uh, the strong driving cleric by the time he got older um, it was showing some real phlegmatic tendencies there. And that, those are godly tendencies. Well, let's look a little more at the, at the um, phlegmatic here. His strengths are he's good natured and he's easygoing. He doesn't carry a grudge. The phlegmatic, he doesn't even get mad, or if he does, it's just not nowhere near the rage that you would find in, for instance, a cleric. Because nothing is that important. He just rolls with the punches. So he carries no grudges. He's peaceful, very peaceful temperament. And he exerts a stabilizing influence on other people. Now we got a classic example of that in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, Paul goes to the city of Ephesus and he preaches Christ. And they were in the city of Ephesus, they worshiped the goddess Diana. And so a man by the name of Demetrius, it's a silversmith, he gets all the town excited. And they just riot in the street. They're going to kill Paul and everyone connected with him because they the, it goes back to money again. Demetrius says we're, he got all the silversmiths together that made those little statues of Diana. And he says, we're going to lose our, our uh, livelihood here. If, he, if these people believe on Jesus, nobody's going to buy our statues anymore. They worked the crowd up. They got them just in a frenzy. And here comes the town clerk. And just, just when things looked like it's the end of the line for Paul, this town clerk comes up and, and he tells them to cool it. He says, you don't have to worry about these things. He, he says, these men haven't destroyed your, your trade. You hasn't, haven't destroyed your goddess. He says, they're just doing, just doing their thing. And, and, and if it's to be, it'll be. You know, it's just so phlegmatic. You read that in your, in your spare, uh, spare time. Acts 19 from uh, verse 32 on to the end of the chapter. And this town clerk, he just quiets the whole crowd and they all disperse. And only a phlegmatic would, uh, could be able to do that. So that's one of the strengths of a phlegmatic. They're humorous. But a different kind of humor from the sanguine. It's a dry humor, and the phlegmatic loves to tease. That's a strong suit with the phlegmatic, to be able to tease you about different things. And in a few minutes, we're going to see the way, they, the, way the phlegmatic will work a sanguine and a cleric and a, and a melancholic uh, 
he'll use their own temperaments against them to work them, and, it, and it's quite humorous. And you'll know what I mean when, when we come to it a little later. They're dependable. The phlegmatic is clear-headed. The sanguine will hurry and blunder. The melancholic, he can't make up his mind. He can't decide. The cleric will make a hurried decision, which usually is a right decision. But the phlegmatic will think things through very practical. He'll think it through to, to its logical conclusion. And you know, if you do that with the Word of God, some of the things that are being taught and preached in churches and on television today, if you think some of that through to its logical conclusion and having your thinking based on the scriptures, um, you'll find out um, many of those, those guys that you're, that you're seeing on TV are nothing more than false prophets. They're, um, they're just um, teaching things that are contrary to the Word of God. A, fly, a phlegmatic will will spot that just like that. The phlegmatic will give good advice, but you gotta ask for it. He doesn't volunteer for anything. He doesn't volunteer to be a leader, he doesn't volunteer to be a counselor, he doesn't volunteer to be a worker. He's just, he's there. You can count on him because he's faithful, but if you wanna get him to do something, you gotta go to him, you have to approach him. He's also very diplomatic, makes a good diplomat because he's so low-key, he doesn't ruffle feathers. The weaknesses of the phlegmatic, however, he's slow, he lacks enthusiasm, he'll react to the moods of other people. Somebody said the action is the reaction, and this is so true with the phlegmatic. If a sanguine comes bursting in with, full of excitement and so forth, you know what the phlegmatic will do? he'll be very cool and aloof to him. If the melancholic comes through the door all broken up and in and, and sorrow, um, he'll probably get teased to a certain degree by the phlegmatic. If the choleric comes along and he's got all these plans that he's gonna change the world with, the phlegmatic will sit back and one by one, very methodically, point out all the weaknesses in his plan to him. It's just a gift that the phlegmatic has for doing that. He's lazy. He's more interested in what is easy than what is right. He's indifferent, and he's got to be moved to action by other people. He won't do it himself. Now, many times this comes off as a superior attitude. He gives that impression that he's superior because he is aloof from the action. Remember, he's He's not out there on the playing field. He doesn't want to be there. He wants to be a spectator in the stands. Spiritually, he's self-righteous. And the reason for that is that the phlegmatic will avoid the deep sins that people fall into. You don't see him deep in sin. He's a sinner, of course, because we're all sinners. But he isn't into that deep sin like other people will, will get into. And so he has a self-righteousness about him. He'll come to church, but he won't be active in church, not unless you really push him. He can change the subject if what you're talking about will bother him. And there's a classic example of that in the Gospel of John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus comes to her, and he asks her to draw him water, and she says, how is it that you're a Jew talking to me, a Samaritan? And, and he talks to her about the living water and so forth, and and she says, where can I get this living water? Jesus, because he knows her, knows all about her, is to win her, he has talked to her about her sin. And so he says, go call your husband. And she very sweetly replies, I don't have a husband. And he says to her, no, you don't. He says, you've had five husbands, and you're living with a man right now that's not your husband. See, he started preaching sin, because you got, to get saved, you've got to repent of your sin. Well, um, she didn't like that, but you know what she does? does? She changes the subject. You read it in John chapter 4 when you get a chance. She changes the subject from talking about her sin to religion. She wanted to know where the right place to worship is. It was it in Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. And uh, very subtly, she just changes the subject. But you know what? That woman got saved. Remember what it said in the parable? about bringing forth fruit a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. That woman went out and she won multitudes in the city of Samaria. 
She pointed them to Christ and they came and the Bible says they believed on Jesus because of her testimony. And so she was an effective believer when she, when she did get saved. All right, the phlegmatic spiritually, he'll compromise his ideals. He'll do that if it's easier for him. Whichever is easiest, that's the phlegmatic route that he'll take. He can be perfectly satisfied with a lower standard. He's idealistic only to a point. And if it's the easy route, he would be prone to take it. He realizes that a high standard is going to cost him. It's going to be costly. And he doesn't want to pay the price. And so he'll, he'll be very happy on the lower road. The classic biblical example of a phlegmatic is Mary. If you, if you turn the page, um, we want to see some of the, th some of the things that, about her. But before we do, I want you to notice in the first column there, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus encourages the phlegmatic here. Now we already used this passage of scripture concerning the, uh, the melancholic. Because every time Jesus said, take no thought, what that literally means is don't worry. Don't worry about these things. The melancholic is the worrier. But this also has a great application to the phlegmatic. He says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, yet for your body what you shall put on. Well, that's an encouragement to the phlegmatic. He's already done that. That's the way he goes through life. In verse 27, he says, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? And it says, To consider the lilies of the field, and so forth. Verse 31, he says, Take no thought what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or what you're going to wear. And in verse 34, he says, Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Here is someone that has uh, already benefited from that teaching. And that's the way the phlegmatic is. He doesn't worry about those things. He isn't worried about what he's going to eat, where he's going to live, and, and all those. And Jesus is teaching it here, t telling us to give it over to God. God will take care of those things. Well, that's very easy for the phlegmatic to do. It's harder for the rest of us. But let's get to Mary. Mary is found, now there's many Marys in the Bible, we're talking about Mary, the sister of Martha. She's found in the Bible three times. A guy said to me years ago, he said, did you know the best Bible school in the world is St. Mary's College? I said, St. Mary's College? What do you mean by that? And he says, I'm talking about St. Mary in the Bible, the sister of Martha. Where is St. Mary's College? Well, every time you see her, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. All three times. John chapter 11, verse 20. Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Notice, Martha, boom, she's taken off. She's going to do something. But Mary sat still. Mary the phlegmatic. She sat still. So Jesus comes into the house, verse 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. Here we see her at the feet of Jesus. St. Mary's College is with a great learning place. It's at the feet of Jesus. She fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. The brother, of course, is Lazarus. We see her again in John chapter 12, verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus. Here she is at his feet again. What did Mary do in the scripture? She sat, but it was always sitting at the feet of Jesus. And then in Luke chapter 10, we have the third time that she's mentioned. It says, it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. Every time she's mentioned, we see her at the feet of Jesus. In verse 40, Martha is cumbered about with much serving. She gets mad at Mary because she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. So she goes to Jesus and complains about her sister. And in verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. There we see her at the feet of Jesus. What is she doing? She's sitting. That's the phlegmatic. She sits. But Jesus said, that 
was the most needful. You know, we, we talk about being a Christian, coming to church, serving the Lord and all that, and we need people to serve the Lord. We need people to be active. There's no, uh, that's just something that comes with being saved. You need to do that. But the most needful thing is to be at the, spending time at the feet of Jesus, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Some people can't sit that long, and uh, they need to give that over to God. We've got to sit long enough, uh, sit at Jesus' feet, and learn from him and from his word. All right, let's go to the next page. The balanced responses of the phlegmatic and the extreme responses of the phlegmatic or the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak the emotions of the phlegmatic we've already seen most of these he's low-key easygoing calm cool collected well balanced and so forth in the other column he's unenthusiastic and fearful and worried now notice the next one there it says indecisive now he's not indecisive like the melancholic the melancholic can't make up their mind at all this indecisiveness is a different kind of indecisiveness in that it's not that he doesn't know what to do, but he's indecisive in the fact that he doesn't want to step out and be different from the crowd. He's perfectly willing to go with the flow, whichever way that might be going. That, that's one of the weaknesses of the, of the phlegmatic temperament. He avoids responsibility. He's got a quiet will of iron, but you don't always see it because rather than exercise that quiet will of iron, He'd rather go with the flow if the flow is going contrary to what he's been thinking. He's also selfish, unfortunately, because his world is not very broad. He, he, remember, he's a spectator. He, he watches, but uh, all of that is out there, and, and he's right here. And so he's basically a selfish individual. He's not, he doesn't have concern for all of you out there. He, he's only concerned about himself. So it translates into selfishness. He's shy, he's a compromiser, and he's self-righteous. The phlegmatic at work, he's competent, steady, peaceful, agreeable, and all of those things under that column. But unfortunately for him, he's not goal-orientated at all. He doesn't work towards a goal. He just goes at a steady pace. He lacks motivation, hard to get him moving, and he resents being pushed. Man, does he resent being pushed. The phlegmatic has his own pace and uh, doesn't matter what's going on around him, he's going to go at that pace and you try to speed that pace up and there's going to be some conflict there. He's lazy, careless, discourages others, would rather watch and he is, he's a watcher. If you've got a phlegmatic friend, you've got a good friend because uh, he's pleasant and easy, good listener, dry sense of humor, all of those things. But the other side of the coin is he can really dampen enthusiasm. He'll stay uninvolved. He's not exciting. He's indifferent to plans. He'll judge others, but he won't make that, those judgments known, but he, he knows them. They're in his heart. Sarcastic and teasing and resists change. He doesn't like change because it's going to upset his procedure. He just goes along the same, plods along day after day. He doesn't want anybody messing with that. So don't try to come in with change. The phlegmatic is a parent. He's a good parent. He'll take his time with children and do all of those things. But unfortunately, uh, his home is very often a mess because he, uh, he doesn't uh, have discipline for himself. Um, that is to, to motivate himself. And so he has a hard time motivating his children also. Going over to the next page, we want to Look at just some of these on this next page. The general description of the phlegmatic. The strongly phlegmatic person is a calm spectator, reconciled to life. He refuses to become involved, but rather lives above or aloof from the struggles going on around him. The phlegmatic sees the happy-go-lucky sanguines restlessly attempting to enjoy life. He sees the brooding melancholic suffering because of the inequities of life. He sees the driving cleric wearing himself out, attempting to change life. The phlegmatic, he follows the advice of Solomon. All is vanity and vexation of the spirit. There's nothing new under the sun. And so sanguine, get excited, melancholic, carry on, have a little hissy fit. Cleric, 
just drive and fume and fuss. Just go ahead. He's unaffected by all of that. The phlegmatic looks at life from an intellectual point of view without being emotionally involved. It's kind of like people watching TV. Some t people, now ladies, I don't want to pick on you ladies, but primarily women will watch TV and uh, like a soap opera or, or a, a romance classic or something, like, you know, and they'll get so involved, you know. Uh, oh, he's going to leave her, that dirty rat, you know. The phlegmatic, he won't do that. He'll sit there smirking. <laughs> I, knew he, I knew he was going to leave her, you know. That. He's, just, he's just so unattached to anything, and that's the way he is with life, not just watching TV. That's the way he looks at life, too. Well, he has his strengths there. We've covered most of those. And he has his weaknesses. He's indolent to the point of laziness, and he tends to shun all demanding effort. He doesn't want to get involved with it. He can easily become an opportunist, and he looks for the comfortable and the easy, rather than the right and the best. And that pretty much describes the phlegmatic. The easy and the comfortable as opposed to what is right and what is best. The French have a name that is a good description of the phlegmatic, blasé. He is blasé. He looks at people with extreme indifference. The sanguine enjoys people and lets them go. He's with them, turns the corner and he's forgotten about them already. The melancholic will disagree with people and let them go. He'll leave hurt but he'll let them go. The cleric will use people, and he'll let them go. They're just a tool in his hand. But the phlegmatic, he's just plain indifferent to people. He can take them or leave them. That's the way he is. Working with the phlegmatic type of person, it will be difficult to get him to exhilarate his pace or display any degree of interest in, in crash programs. When it comes to crash programs, they are non-existent in his life. He goes at one pace and that's it. He has a frustrating way of reminding folks that had they planned better, they would now not be in the pickle that they're in. And his life is one that is planned out. He's, that's why there's never, uh, he's never caught off guard, never taken by surprise. It's all, all very uh, theorized, theorized step by step by step. He's a good man to work out a program, but he's not the man to sell that program. Platform presence of a phlegmatic will put you to sleep. He's just plain boring. And you know, a lot of times, missionaries get a bad rap. People say, I don't want to hear a missionary because they're boring. That's true. Most missionaries are boring. You know why they're missionaries? <laughs> they're missionaries because God has never called them into a pastorate because they're not good speakers. God has not called them into teaching in a in a Christian school because they're not good speakers. They're, they're born. Now they go out in the mission field. They're, they can be a great missionary. That phlegmatic personality, they can go out there and, and with one-on-one, -on -one, you know, they can do a great job. I think we do them a disservice sometimes when, we, when they come home on furlough and say, hey, come and speak to us, you know. You know, they, they'll put you to sleep so fast. I had a teacher one time. He was a, he was a phlegmatic a real flag, phlegmatic, and he knew it. And the class was 40 minutes long. And at the 20-minute mark, he used to have the whole class stand up and go like this. And then he'd say, you know, do it for a minute or so, and then he'd say, okay, sit down, and then we'd have the second half of the class. Because he knew his monotone voice would just put people to, put them to sleep. So it's hard to, hard to stay awake when the phlegmatic is speaking. He sounds more like a walking encyclopedia than a motivator of men. He'll see all sides of a problem and he can come up with a workable solution. Good for him. He's good that way. His chief personal struggle will be against his own smug, self-sufficient attitude that he has. The sanguine gets excited about things. The melancholic is unhappy with things. The cleric wants to change things, but the phlegmatic he likes things just as they are. He's happily reconciled to things, no matter what they are. He's totally resigned to his fate. This is what the Apostle Paul said there in, in uh, Philippians chapter 4. He says, whatsoever state, he says, I've learned, whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. 
The nature of the phlegmatic is good natured. He doesn't carry a grudge. He's a quiet spectator. He's not vexed by others. And he desires as little noise and as little excitement as possible. The sanguine, the more noise, the more he likes it. The phlegmatic will sit at a ball game when the guy comes up with his team behind and two outs in the ninth inning and the base is loaded and they're down by three runs and the guy parks a home run with the bases loaded into the stands and wins the game. The crowd will be going in a frenzy and the phlegmatic will sit there very happily. My team won, you know, no, no excitement at all. In marriage, the phlegmatic is an excellent example of it takes two to make a quarrel. He won't quarrel because he doesn't like to fight. He likes things peaceful, and so uh, that makes a big, uh, it's a big help in his, in his marriage. He, in the midst of turbulence, he can have a calming influence on people. I believe Ben Franklin was probably a phlegmatic. Benjamin Franklin, when they were ha trying to hammer out first the Articles of Confederation and then uh, the Constitution of the United States afterwards, the representative from, representatives from the 13 colonies fought like crazy. They called each other's names. There was actually a couple of fistfights right there. They'd get so mad at each other over something. Ben Franklin sat there as a calm spectator and he'd ask for the floor and he'd get up there and like the town clerk, that we saw in the book of Acts there, Acts chapter 19. Benjamin Franklin could calm that crowd down. He'd tell a little humorous story, many times poking fun at himself, but he'd just uh, bring a quiet spirit to the Constitutional Convention. And um, uh, so he had, a great, he had a great effect upon them. The sense of humor of a phlegmatic, as we already said, is a dry humor. When people tell a joke, they usually say, hey, I got a joke, or I'm a, you know, the people are telling jokes. And the, when the phlegmatic gets in on that, he never says, I, I got a joke. He tells it in, without expression, and you think it's something that's real. And so when he delivers the punchline, it really is funny because you think, he, you think the guy is, is, uh, is saying something that, that actually, actually happened. And so um, his, his humor, though it's a dry sense of humor, he'll take you completely by surprise. His, the tone of his voice will stay calm. And uh, another thing he does, he'll never laugh at his own jokes. He'll just stand there and when it, sometimes it takes a, a few seconds for the humor of it to hit you. And then everybody bursts out laughing. The phlegmatic, he's just standing there smirking to himself. He knew you were going to laugh. it just take a little longer. That's all. In danger, he's cool. He has a presence of mind, but you've got to force him into action. And that's done two ways. Either circumstances have to uh, enlist him into action or other people have to do it. He won't, he's not going to do it on his own. His mind, the mind of the phlegmatic, it's a practical mind. It's not profound like the mind of a melancholic. It's not keen like the mind of a cleric. And it's not impulsive like the mind of a sanguine. It's a practical mind that can think things through. There are many scientists that are phlegmatic. You probably don't know the names of any of them. And the reason for that is they don't have a brilliant mind like the, like the uh, melancholic does, and so they don't come up with brilliant ideas. But what they can do, and what they do do, is take the brilliant ideas that the melancholic has come up with and practically apply them and put them to work. And they're a bunch of faceless, nameless scientists that are simply carrying out uh, uh, great ideas that other men have, have come up with. The potential of a phlegmatic, he never reaches it, never does. And uh, anything he does, he has to be asked to do. If you ask the advice of a phlegmatic, and you have to, if you want his advice, you've got to ask him because he's not going to volunteer it. The sanguine, he's got plenty of advice that he'll shoot at you 
off the top of his head. He'll tell you all kinds of things what you've got to do. The melancholic, he has a hard time giving advice because he can't relate to other people, so he doesn't really understand the problem. The cleric, he hasn't got time to give you advice. It's a bunch of nonsense to him anyways, whatever your problem is. But the phlegmatic gives good sound advice, and very seldom does he blunder, but you've got to ask him for it. He's not carried away by sentiment. He's not carried away by joy of others. He's not carried away by the sorrow of others. He's not carried away by the anger of others. He's not carried away by the enthusiasm of others. He just greets it all. Humor, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, joy, sentiment, enthusiasm, anger. He just greets it all with an ironic smile. It doesn't move him. His reaction to these others. We already talked about that a little bit. To the sanguine, he's as cold as ice. Sanguine comes in, <laughs> you know, I'm going to do this. You know, he just stand there. Huh. To the melancholic, he's optimistic and he teases. Tease the melancholic. You know, what are you looking so sad for? You know, uh, bu button up your shirt. Your heart's falling off. You know, stuff like that. It, he'll, he'll tease him all the time. To the choleric, he'll throw cold water on all of his projects and on all of his Show him every point of weakness he's got. That cleric comes in there driving away, you know, harsh and so forth. This is what we're going to do. Flag man just sits back and <laughs> he says, you know, that, that's no good. Look, look here, you got to, this don't work here. This isn't going to work over here and so forth. When it comes to others, he enjoys them he, and then forgets them. He sees the stupidity of others, the foolishness of others, the vanity of others, the ego of others, and he's all blasé towards all of them. The religion of the sanguine. He doesn't go into deep sin, as we already said. He's usually conservative. You say, why is he conservative? Because it takes less effort to be a conservative than a liberal. The liberal comes up with all these hair-brained, fuzzy-brained ideas. The, the sanguine, he's laid back. He, he doesn't want to get get involved in all that activity. And so just by nature, he becomes, he always is conservative, just simply because it takes uh, a less effort. He's got his own code of morality and self-righteousness. He would fall into the secret disciple syndrome. He can be a believer, in, uh, which and this isn't really biblical, but he can be a believer and not let people know about it. He doesn't want make any waves, doesn't like making any kind of waves, so he just keeps quiet. I worked with a guy like that once, and uh, I witnessed to him. I didn't think he was saved, and he says to me, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah. He says, I am too. He says, but don't tell people around here about it. <laughs> okay. Don't make waves. Second Timothy 1.7 says, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. The phlegmatic has a sound mind. He can remain sober and uh, he'll compromise his ideals, but he'll, he'll follow that steady course. He has a sound mind. Now on the next page, we got our little phlegmatic guy here. He's sitting there at his table so calm and peaceful and happy. That's the phlegmatic. Every combination is usually good when the phlegmatic is the dominant temperament. Here he is, the phlegmatic with the, the sanguine, the, the flag sang, we call him. That's a, that's a good blend. Yeah, he's got that happiness there. Those are both happy temperaments, sanguine and phlegmatic. They're both happy temperaments. The f sanguine is the boisterous happy temperament. The phlegmatic is the quiet happy temperament. It's a good blend. It's, it's a joy to be around. Here's the, the flag chlor, um, the dominant temperament, the phlegmatic with the cleric behind him. That's a good thing because the cleric in him will give him a little bit of drive uh, to get him off his duff to, to do something. The flag mail, uh, that's also a good blend there because um, it kind of balances him out as long as that phlegmatic is the dominant temperament. Well, the last page is the practical advice to the phlegmatic. To pray only when you're in peril is like using your seatbelt only in heavy traffic. The phlegmatic needs to realize he needs to trust God at all times. Fear is cowardly, but faith is aggressive. Love is aggressive. Goodness is aggressive. Satan also is aggressive, but Jesus is more aggressive. And what the phlegmatic needs in his life is some of the godly aggressiveness 
uh, that, that it's talking about there. And then finally, it is better to burn out than to smolder out without having warmed one heart for the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Loving Father, thank you for each one that's come. And we do pray, Lord, that uh, we might, like Paul and others have done, seek to uh, have temperaments that are pleasing to you. And those bad things, those weaknesses, Lord, uh, may we be conscious about them and work on them and turn them over to you uh, so that our lives may exemplify uh, the grace of God in all that we say and do and point others to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now dismiss us with your blessing, we pray. We thank you for meeting with us this night. In Jesus' name, amen.